So, uh, guten Tag, uh, good afternoon, bon dia. I'm very happy to welcome you today to our webinar together with my co-organizers from the Federal University of Minas Gerais in Brazil and the NGO Global Canopy. I will be your moderator today. My name is Nicole and I'm Fern Sustainable Consumption and Production Campaigner. Before I continue to further introduce you to the co-hosts and the panelists, I would like to draw your attention to the interpretation channels. So this meeting will be available in English, uh, German and Portuguese. At the bottom of your Zoom screen, you should see a globe entitled interpretation and there you can select among the three languages. If you select the language uh, from the interpretation, please do also click mute original audio. So that way you can only hear the interpretation and not also not the uh, original language because unless you're a trained interpreter, that might be confusing. So again, a very warm welcome together with my co-organizers from Global Canopy and Federal University of Minas Gerais. Our co-organizers are Helen Belfield. She's a director of TRACE, the impressive platform that is allowing many of us and you to follow the commodity flows around the globe. Secondly, we have uh, Rauni Rajau. He's professor at the Department of Production Engineering at the Federal University of Minas Gerais. And he has recently brought out the analysis of Brazilian soya and beef exports to the EU, which was provokingly entitled The Rotten Apples of Brazilian Agriculture. Both our co-organizers will present today. In addition, we have a stellar lineup of speakers with uh, representatives from the European Parliament's Agricultural and Environment Committees, Maria Neuchel and Mr. Nikolai Stefanuta. And similarly, from the Brazilian Congress and Senate, we have Mr. C. Silva and Mr. Fabiano Contarato. There will be important announcements on legal proposals on deforestation from both parliaments later today, but I do not want to steal their thunder. So I will say no more. So please stay tuned on this webinar. As a core to this webinar, we will have three technical presentations, including from the Institu Instituto Socioambiental, ISA, represented by Adriana Ramos. Then we will have two inputs by the Brazilian representatives to the National Congress. And we will have three reactions, one from the private sector uh, of one of the main slaughter uh, slaughterhouses in Brazil, Marfrig. Then we have a reaction from a member of European Parliament, Mr. Stefanuta, shadow rapporteur on an EU legal framework to halt and reverse EU-driven global deforestation. And Finally, we have a word from Germany, who is currently holding the EU presidency, and the presidency will be represented by the deputy head of division for international agricultural policy, agriculture and innovation at the Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development of Germany, Ms. Lisa Kiefer Rühle. So before we move to presentations, um, I would like to remind us of some housekeeping. Um, Daria, if you could put on the housekeeping uh, slide. We already talked about the uh, possibility to listen to interpretation. Um, there will be possibility to uh, pose uh, questions. We'll have a question and answer session after all inputs will be made. We will only ask for cl uh, clarification questions after the technical presentations. The larger debate we will have when we've had all inputs after an hour or so. My, co uh, my colleague Cristiani Fontis from Global Canopy is working in, in, the, in the back office, so to say. She will gather the questions from the question and answer chat. Uh, she, will, she might group them if there are similar questions. And then we will call on you in the question answer session to put on your microphone and if you wish your video, so you could uh, enter into a, a dialogue with the speakers. 
This is also to say that this meeting is being recorded. So the recording uh, in the English language will be available um, later on. Finally, I also have to remind myself, but this is uh, directed to uh, our panelists. Please speak slowly so the uh, interpreters can follow. Now, before my Maria Neuchel, member of the Agricultural Committee of the European Parliament, will introduce us to the discussions on the topic of deforestation, supply chains, EU due diligence. Uh, we have the pleasure to show you the latest work of uh, photojournalist Victor Moriyama, who has recently documented fires in Brazil related to agricultural expansion. Last and this summer, this issue was heavily uh, present in international media and drew very strong reactions in Brazil, here in Europe, and also at international summits and debates. So Victor Moriyama is based in Sao Paulo. He is a, a photojournalist covering South America for the international press, such as the New York Times and Le Monde. And let's take a look at what's going on in Brazil and uh, let's look at one of the reasons why we're discussing deforestation and supply chains today. So I would like to give the floor to Victor to portray his latest expedition to the Cerrado and the Amazon, which was supported by Rainforest Foundation Norway. Victor, the floor is yours. Good morning and good afternoon to all. It is a pleasure to be here opening this panel with such an important initiative to be discussing initiatives to the conservation of Brazilian biomes that are so vital for the whole planet. My name is Vito Moriana. I am a photographer and I work frequently for the international press as well for a few international NGOs that work with nature conservancy and my work is predominantly carried out in South America. I go visit the Amazon and the Cerrado, the main biomes uh, of Brazil. Recently in these images you are now seeing this is an uh, tra a field uh, study done with uh, Rainforest Foundation Norway to investigate deforestation in the Cerrado and Amazon biomes. We traveled uh, 2,300 kilometers through these two biomes and we have never crossed a single time with um, the Obama representatives who are in charge of monitoring and uh, tackling deforestation. So it's very grave and very serious that n not a single uh, uh, monitoring activity was carried out uh, to prevent deforestation and the fires. The fire is destroying the forest in Brazil and we need the initiatives by the Brazilian government to fight this. We, what it did see were the local residents trying to fight fire in their properties. These, is, these are images from the north of Mato Grosso state and also from Pará state. These are fires occurring in federal reservation areas legally protected by the federal government. Working in Brazil is an, a dangerous activity. We are the third most violent country for activists in the environment. And so working in the field represents a risk, a threat to our lives. We can see from deforestation figures uh, lately deforestation is on the rise in Brazil and what we see is 
also very violent conflicts uh, arising from deforestation. We see houses uh, for, from local residents on fire, activists being threatened to death, some have dece uh, been killed, and it results in a lot of violence. And residents were trying to put fires down and they tried to call the fire uh, brigades, but they wouldn't come. So the state was not helping at all. Uh, and this is a reflection of a, stru a structural problem. And we are trying to really understand what's going on. So in these images, we had a lot of wind and it was a very impressive situation. So it was quite hard to really convey the sounds as well. The birds were crying for help and were suffering because the forest was dying and you can see here that the volume of uh, fires has increased exponentially. So this is a portrait of what's happening in uh, the Brazilian Savana de Cerrado and the states which cover the Amazon forest. And these images show the situation of these biomes and the death of these biomes because this is what's happening in Brazil and uh, birds and nature and animals as well. So thank you very much for your attention and I'm very happy to answer your questions and we will continue to perform our work and to denounce this situation. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the impressive pictures and your testimony. It's a sure, um, yeah, important for uh, us to see and understand the local uh, realities. I would li now like to ask a member of the European Parliament, Maria Neuchel from Germany, to uh, brief us on the concerns by the European Parliament's Agricultural Committee about these fires, about intensive livestock farming, about our dependence on uh, soya from South America and deforestation. Maria, the, the floor is yours. Ganz herzlichen Dank für die Einladung und a big thank you for your invitation and also a big thank you to the photographer that was impressive i think everyone connected here we all know that this is the day-to-day -day reality about one third of soya consumed in the eu comes from brazil and 10 percent of all brazilian beef is imported into the eu so brazil and the european union have a very close link when we talk about beef and when we talk about soya so it's clear, and I want to state that straight at the beginning, if we talk about responsibility, we also need to talk about guilt. Uh, we talk here about the EU being partly to blame for these forests burning, and anyone who wants to mitigate this, they do not recognize the reality of the situation. We are responsible in Europe in all areas of politics, and the, um, the European legislation is starting on their journey. That's how I want to call it. So we start the journey to tackle the topic of deforestation, and this is about import of soya, but also of um, palm oil and timber on top of soya and beef to, to regulate this because soya, palm oil and timber are the biggest building sites we have. This import causes uh, deforestations exactly as we have seen them in these images. And uh, the European politics is driving these flames. Our agricultural policy is like oil adding to the flame of these fires. 
I'm very happy that I can say we have a very clear um, objective in Europe. We want to uh, have legislation for no deforestation, no destruction of ecosystems, no forest degradation and no human right violations in this era. We don't want to support this anymore. We have this objective, but uh, it's a long journey, a long path to get there. How will we try and do this? I think it's important to say that the EU, the Commission and the Parliament uh, with their Green Deal try to have an umbrella for a new path, a new way in terms of uh, legislation, uh, a new way which is also in line with climate policy. The Green Deal, which is still on the table in paper form, it's like an umbrella. Um, and under this umbrella, many things need to happen, and I want to enumerate a few of them. First of all, the EU is considering uh, regulatory measures to fight deforestation in supply chains. And the European Commission, and I'm very grateful to the Commission for this, they are doing an impact assessment of regulatory and non-regulatory measures uh, for the intensification of EU measures to protect um, forests worldwide. So that's an important area, impact assessment on the one hand and regulatory measures on the other, but that is not enough. We need a supply chain uh, regulation or legislation, especially for agriculture, not just uh, in textiles, but also in agriculture, which makes it clear that responsibility is not just in Europe on European ground, but that the responsibility is also in countries which uh, uh, produce uh, for uh, the European markets. If you want, if you want to make progress, we have to be active on all political fields. And I want to name a few: our trade policy. Our trade policy, policy, the European trade policy, it's like a cancer that is eating itself through the world. The Mercosur Agreement, for instance, which is being uh, negotiated right now, is uh, a huge problem. I'm very proud that my own region, Bavaria, that the SPD took a decision that we will not agree to the Mercosur Agreement. There's also a memoratorium for uh, uh, imports of soil from uh, South America, that's planned. So wrong trade policy adds fuel to forests that are already burning. And the Mercosur agreement is something to criticize. Uh, we fight that any further agreements, Mercosur mustn't come at all, but we fight for any further agreements uh, that sustainability commitments are necessary um, for European trade policy. And they have to be binding. And above all, they have to be sanctionable, these sustainability commitments. Um, the binding nature and the fact that there can be san sanctions, that is the basis uh, for taking any such new legislation seriously. If it's not binding, if there aren't any sanctions, then the same will happen as if other voluntary agreements, nothing. For decades, we have been working with voluntary agreements, but they don't produce results unless there are um, binding sanctions. Next week, there's a, a, a vote in the parliament with the Weibon report, and we ask um, to action in exactly this area. So the trade policy needs to change. We need a lot of uh, legislation changes also in agricultural policies. I'm a member of the Agricultural Committee. We need to recognize that, you know, that the offshoring of uh, European um, feed areas, and that's what we do by importing soya, it's as if we import our pastures um, and, uh, and, and areas, that this is a driver of forest fires. Let's be honest, Europe is living on more area than we have in Europe. So this is not a partnership way of dealing with the rest of the world. So, you know, these um, uh, uh, feed areas and pastures cannot be offshored. We need a new EU protein plan, which makes it clear that uh, we are responsible 
responsible for the production of protein to feed our animals. And we also have to recognize the limits for animal husbandry. We uh, have to recognize what limits there are to intensive animal husbandry. And uh, we need, uh, as I said, introduction of sustainability criteria for feedstuffs, palm oil and timber. And we need a new uh, legislative initiative for um, for all this. That's essential. But one thing I want to say as well before I hand over the floor, we will not succeed in this, irrespective of how many new regulations and laws we start, unless we have a fundamental change in our system, a change in how we feed our animals. It's um, bizarre that um, cattle um, in uh, Europe feed on soya. Uh, you know, what has been done, they have been intensively farmed, which is not in line with animal protection, and uh, it's not sustainable in terms of climate policy. So we need to change our attitude. Uh, we, that push to intensify everything in agriculture, that needs to be changed. We need to recognize our limits and how we feed our animals is an important area. We need to understand that uh, uh, European agriculture cannot feed the world, but that, you know, we should have limits so that the other regions of the world can feed themselves. That's another important point which I wanted to make. And, you know, the area we have uh, on this world cannot be extended. In Germany, we talk about free, free teas, Tank Teller Trug in German. The uh, area that we have, we need to use for energy generation, for feeding people, and for the feeding um, animals, tank teller trog in German, um, to find the right balance in these three areas. That is the job of the EU. The EU for their very own 27 member countries, but it's also the job of the EU to make sure that in other regions of the world, they have the same opportunities to cover these three areas, the three T's which I have uh, mentioned. Thank you very much for inviting me. We have uh, a hill of work ahead of us, but the, the first change really starts in the head. That's why we need events and campaigners, organizations like you, who promote and advertise um, or, 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 or campaign for better agricultural policy in Europe, uh, incorporating um, these ideas. Thank you very much for inviting me and I'm looking forward to your questions. Maria, thank you very much um, for this impressive uh, plaidoyer. Um, you have brought it very good in, in context, uh, what is happening or what uh, the European Parliament is thinking, what pat particular political groups are thinking about our, our import dependency. And with this, we are moving to the next section of our webinar, the three technical presentations about commodity flows from Brazil to the EU, but also about the proposals so reform proposals coming from Brazil, learning from the systems that they have in, in place on monitoring deforestation and monitoring exports to the EU. We will first start with a presentation by Helen, who will remind us of how much soya and uh, beef we import into the EU. Helen, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you very much, Nicole. Great. So TRACE is a supply chain transparency initiative by Global Canopy and SEI. Um, and it maps the middle part of the supply chain. So it maps in the case of Brazilian soy and beef exports, it maps the exports from the production municipalities you can see on the left hand side of the map uh, via the soy silos and slaughterhouses to the ports via the exporters and the first importers 
um, to the country of import or the economic block on the right hand side. And it uses data on, to do this, we use data on per shipment trade, tax data, asset ownership, so who owns the slaughterhouses and silos, cattle movement data, and production. So we're able to connect downstream markets and actors to places of production, and therefore to environmental and social impacts in these places. So Trace also estimates the commodity deforestation risk in these places of production using data on deforestation and crop area or pasture area. So for each municipality, we estimate the share of exports sourced by each company or importing country, and we assign commodity deforestation risk in each municipality proportionally using the same share. So for example, if the UK sourced half the soy exported from Saprizal, we would also assign the UK half the soy deforestation risk in that municipality. So this provides a measure of risk that a company or a country is exposed uh, uh, of deforestation is exposed to based on its sourcing patterns. So, so shifting to Brazil soy exports to Europe and the world. Um, so China has overtaken the EU in the past decade, decade as a main importer of Brazilian soy exports. And in 2018, it imported five times the volume of the EU. However, over that same decade, the EU was exposed to double the soy deforestation risk per ton of its imported soy in China. And the reason for this is that the EU has historically bought from higher risk regions than China. However, you can see in this graph, the, the EU is the blue line, that this relative risk, so the soy deforestation risk per ton, is declining over time, and in 2018 was the, the market average. Just trying to change slide. So the a really important message is that the EU's imported soy deforestation risk is highly concentrated. So here on the map, you can see the Mato Piba region, which is a, a key frontier of deforestation in the Sahado. And while the EU only sourced 7% of its soy volumes from this region, this same region accounted for more than 60% of its overall soy deforestation risk exposure from its soy imports. And similarly, if you go to the farm level, a trace study uh, earlier this year estimated that 20% of the EU soy from Mato Grosso, which provides around a third of EU soy imports from Brazil in 2018, um, were linked to farms where illegal deforestation had taken place. Um, but again, these risks, even at the farm level, are highly concentrated. And in Mato Grosso as a whole, 80% of this illegal deforestation took place on only 2% of farms. So this risk concentration provides tangible opportunities for Europe to address these risks. So moving to cattle and beef, so in 2019, the, the Brazil provided over a third of EU's beef imports. Um, so it's a critical market for the EU. Um, but the EU's sourcing regions, um, as mapped in 2017 by Trace, show that the EU mainly sources from the south and central west of Brazil, um, where there's lower deforestation risk. Um, and therefore, the EU has lower exposure than many other export markets, um, such as China. And we're also updating the data later this year for 2018 and 2019. So what risk um, the EU does have is concentrated in the Sahado. Um, so you can see in, to, towards the, the top, uh, the, the middle of the, of the map here. However, these risks are likely to rise. Um, so in 2016, the EU licensed 14 new states for export, and these include uh, regions with much higher deforestation risk, including Hondonia, 
Para, Acre, Tokinchins, and Maranyao. Similarly, if the Mercosur agreement um, goes ahead, we'd expect an increase um, by about 40,000 tonnes of beef imported from Brazil. So with that, I'd like to just end, uh, end with a slide to note that the, the government's looking at addressing imported deforestation risk. So here I've got the example of France, the UK and the EU action plan. All of these recognise the critical need for, to address data gaps uh, and to improve transparency um, to the success of any measures to, to reduce imported deforestation. And with that, I'd like to, to close. I'm very happy to take any clarification questions. Many thanks. Thank you, Helen. Uh, may I suggest we take uh, all clarification questions on the technical presentations after all three presentations are, are done. With this, uh, I would like to uh, invite uh, Raoni uh, to the floor. Based on Tracy's data, he has gone a step further, uh, looked at property level data, and he will make an interesting proposal for monitoring uh, beef and potentially soya supply chains much more closely than what we are currently used to. Rauni, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much, Nicole. For, you know, it has been a, a great experience to be here and I'm glad to be able to contribute. I'm now taking uh, remote control, just a second. And I would like to apologize for, you know, for some of the, of the background noise. Okay. So as a starting point, I think it's important uh, to say that uh, Brazil has the potential to be a big food provider, not only for the country and for the world sustainably. Uh, it has a large amount of areas that have already been open. So historically, uh, it has been able to produce grain-fed agriculture with a low uh, um, uh, carbon footprint at local level, if you don't consider the issue of deforestation, and even cattle, since most of it is raised uh, not intensively, but actually uh, in, in open fields, it has some good levels of animal welfare. However, the problem of deforestation really creates a big problem uh, and, and indeed makes Brazil's agriculture one of the most uh, 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 problematic agricultures in the world since it uh, emits a high level of greenhouse gases. Um, so basically, one of the issues here really is how to move Brazil uh, from a situation where uh, that there is a, winter, uh, a, a close relationship between deforestation, greenhouse emissions, and food production on the one hand, and the other, other hand, you have issues related uh, uh, to the possibility of cleaning uh, supply chains from deforestation. And there are basically three main approaches to that. One is through private certification. Uh, the second is through uh, food transparency of the GTA uh, uh, data, which is basically the cattle permits, which is uh, uh, issued when one when the cattle move, moves from one farm to the other, and property level uh, information. And finally, it's the proposal of having a governmental, a governmental tracking system that already combines those two systems, and, and right now it does not exist. But first of all, uh, as in the previous presentation, there has been a focus on the issue of beef, uh, of, of soy, but also beef uh, in Brazil uh, has a major, uh, it's, it's very problematic from the point of view of uh, uh, the relation with deforestation. Uh, indeed, in our study, we have found that at least 70% of the beef exported to the EU uh, is linked to deforestation. And, uh, and we did a step further and analyzed um, this, uh, the uh, farms which have, have already been um, uh, um, authorized by the European Union to export uh, 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 its beef in Brazil, and they actually are subject to uh, some form of private certification. And what we have found uh, by basically analyzing the farms in the EU trade control expert system, that they don't, don't only uh, have a substantial level of deforestation, so basically these are aggregated at uh, a municipal level, uh, from the around 40 farms in, uh, that are authorized to export to the EU, 11 have, have deforested directly, and this other one, six have deforested directly, but, but most importantly, they have been buying a substantial amount of their cows 
from other farms to the forest. So there is a lot of indirect deforestation uh, coming from other farms uh, to those uh, um, farms that then export their meat uh, to the EU. And, and when it comes to uh, providing data about the situation uh, of um, deforestation in Brazil, we have a very confusing situation because companies, uh, they present to their buyers in the EU, in other places, reports uh, and also private certifications that shows that, for instance, like in this one, uh, they have zero deforestation in their supply chain, or for instance, present uh, 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 you know, some reports saying that they, they, they hunk very highly in sustainability uh, uh, evaluations. However, uh, what we see next are studies such as ours, uh, such as traces, such as, for instance, uh, this one presented by The Guardian, that shows that uh, many of the big uh, companies are, are indeed buying from the forested areas and they are part of the problem. Um, and see, so basically one of the issues we have here that even though private certifications have already been adopted by large companies and there is little political resistance to expanding this, and indeed uh, the EU uh, initial proposal for solving this issue has been to push uh, private certification further, we have been seeing that there is a high cost for individuals uh, and also small meat packers and at the same time you have a lack of transparency and increased risk of fraud and also market mistress because it has already been shown uh, that there are some uh, some uh, lack of correlation between what we haven't seen on the ground and some of those certifications have been pointing out the other solution one of the solutions for that is basically to open up all the public data uh, uh, that is collected in brazil that's currently on hold uh, at the hands of the brazilian government so that academia ngos universities etc could do their own in independent checking of the situation of supply chains rather than relying uh, on what private monitoring and private certifiers do. And this involves uh, actually getting a very personal information about the farmers and the production so that, for instance, you know uh, that a specific farmer with ID number so and so have been selling this amount of cattle to this specific uh, a cattle ranch uh, a meat packer to this place and at the same time you need also property uh, uh, data showing for instance the name and the, and the ID number of that person. And so one of the adventures of that approach that is already adopted by the public attorney in Brazil, by researchers such as such us uh, and, and also by NGOs, uh, but one of the problems we have here uh, is that uh, it needs some complex data matching and most importantly uh, it needs to disclose producers names and commercial information and because of that there is substantial political uh, uh, um, uh, resistance to that for some also some good reasons so what we are proposing here is to for the for the brazilian government to take its own responsibility uh, through uh, uh, basically um, um, as a way to comply to a specific legislation whereby the connection between car and gta would be done at uh, a system by the government and uh, where the access to that information would be done simply by uh, by using the car number which is uh, 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 so, so that's something that works like uh, a plate of a car a proper uh, a car but actually connect to a specific location to a specific farm And so basically, by accessing this system, you would add this code, uh, which has the information about the property, and it would show the location of the property, if there are embargo, fine, suppression, suppression permits, so that if to see if that deforestation has been eventually authorized, which actually it's a very small percentage of the total deforestation that is taking place. And also you would know who are the suppliers who are selling the cows to that specific farm. An example of that already exists uh, uh, in, in some companies where they would, for instance, if you get uh, a, a piece of meat uh, and, and, you, and you type the information about that piece of meat uh, in a website, it would give you uh, the name of the farms where that meat has come from or potentially come from. However, it only showed the names of the farm and that's not very useful information, especially from an environmental point of view. What is crucial is to access from this information uh, and, and, and also understand what is the level of environmental protection and compliance of that farm. So it shows here an example where we would, for instance, type in uh, the code of a specific farm and it would show you uh, where it is, uh, what's the area, how much deforestation has been taking place there, whether there has been embargo, and who was also providing 
uh, uh, cattle to that farm. In this case, it would be a farm which env with environmental problems. But also it would show the farms uh, which does, does, do not have environmental problems such as this, which actually happen to be the majority of farms. So that's why we, we understand that that's a preferable solution, which has the advantage of requiring no additional cost for an individual rancher. It combines public data and uh, it does not expose personal uh, data. Uh, it can also be applied to so the soil supply chain. And since you have uh, the geographic information about where the farm, where the food is coming from, there, is, there can also be an independent transparency check of that information uh, by NGOs, by the EU, by different actors interested in, in having a very robust uh, system uh, in place. That's it. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Rahoni, um, for this positive presentation, for presenting a potential solution to uh, monitoring deforestation related to cattle and potentially soya. We've already received questions uh, of clarification on Helen's presentation and your presentation. We will read them after Adriana um, makes the last technical um, presentation. With this, I would first like to formally uh, introduce Adriana. Welcome, Adriana Ramos. Uh, she coordinates the policy and law program of the Instituto Social Ambiental, ISA, in Brazil, and is advocating to improve social in and environmental policies related to indigenous people's rights, tropical forests, and other ecosystems in Brazil. She has uh, represented NGOs in the past at the National Environmental Council, and she was one of the representatives of NGOs on the guidance committee of the Amazon Fund. Adriana, the floor for your proposals is yours. Muito obrigada, Nicole. É, bom dia e boa tarde a todos. É, obrigada pelo convite e pela oportunidade de estar aqui. Good afternoon to everybody. I really thank you for the opportunity to be here today. I believe we are faced with a big challenge to fulfill the commitments taken by Brazil for the environment. We have seen an advancement in, de in debate, but there is still a big gap in implementing all the commitments. If the commitments are fulfilled, Brazil would be in a much more comfortable position in the, uh, in the world and trading its products in the global market. But I believe that we are not implementing as we could. What we do expect is that in this background of in intense international debate and different countries and entities manifesting concerns about fulfilling these com commitments that Brazil will be able to advance them in a timely manner. Deforestation is already recognized as a strong indicator of uh, environmental problems, but we have other indicators related to the agribusiness and other activities that are not taken into consideration. We released a report uh, this week what, that shows that violence and conflicts uh, related to indigenous populations in Brazil has increased 65% in recent years. So it's very important to work in a tenure and human rights observatory to help advance these debates. So first, the Brazilian goals in the Paris Agreement are very fragile. And this is one of the uh, this is part of the commitments also in the Mercosur trade agreement with the EU. Still, these are very fragile goals. We also see the violation of human rights related to crop production in Brazil as a key issue in the production of commodities in general. And we have been observing setbacks in legal framework and enforcement in Brazilian government 
for the Amazon. So the legal safeguards that used to be in place in Brazil are being little by little uh, demobilized. In this sense, it is important that besides signaling all the violations of legal framework already in place, we also need to lead legal uh, efforts to increase the establishment of legal reserves and indigenous territories. So recently, the Brazilian government uh, revoked 27 uh, procedures to establish uh, indigenous reservations in Brazil. So this is a major setback. As I mentioned, Brazilian goals for the Paris Agreement involve the reduction of illegal deforestation, but however, over 80% Actually, 85% of deforestation in the state of Mato Grosso is illegal deforestation. So we need to improve control measures for the country. We have also observed a huge effort to develop new laws that uh, convert illegal deforestation into legalized or authorized deforestation. So we have a new uh, law bill that will increase the rate of legal reserve that can actually be cleared. So the legal reserve in the forest codes uh, is the main protection of native uh, forest. And also we are seeing measures to increase the flexibility for licensing. We also have infralegal changes uh, done by the government. I want to mention the case of timber. So we have measures of control of timber exports that are not being fulfilled by the government. The Brazilian government it has not the capability to control all the timber exports currently done in the by producers in the country. Also, we have the issue of human rights violation in the production of commodities and how these issues are invisible. The Mato Grosso do Sul, one of the states mentioned in our report as a big uh, beef supplier to the European market, several indigenous individuals are actually employees in slaughterhouses, and we see uh, several breaches in, uh, in the law, including uh, labor legislation uh, for indigenous populations. So the idea here is try to advance in the recognition of these uh, violations, violation of labor rights, and as well as other impacts that are considered indirect uh, impacts such as water quality, vulnerability to diseases, and food security challenges for indigenous peoples in these areas. We need also to take into consideration that the Brazilian government has reduced significantly the transparency of its data systems. It's actually menacing the consistency of the National Spatial Data Institute, which is a, f a benchmark for environmental data in Brazil. We, however, we still have access to independent systems that map deforestation and human rights violations. We also have the possibility of engage with local communities to advance legislation and engagement of local leaderships. And we are advocating that all these systems are integrated to generate a, a single system, a single control system 
so we can have an actual uh, control of all impacts related to the commodities uh, production chain. In conclusion, I would like to analyze the Brazilian goals, the, the, Brazi the analysis of Brazilian goals and the control and monitoring of these goals is a huge global issue. Brazil has been recognized in the past as a big advocate for the environmental cause and it, this is now being reversed. Uh, just to give you an idea of the problems we are facing, um, I can tell you that the, the Brazilian economic policies are going against environmental practices. The Brazilian government has recently released a program to voluntary greenhouse gas emissions uh, uh, reduction goals and the government in this program takes no responsibility in regulating the voluntary carbon market and that demonstrates the lack of seriousness and political will to engage in environmental uh, goals so this is this decreases the trust and confidence that the Brazilian government will implement effective control and monitoring systems. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Adriana, um, also uh, for making concrete pr proposals on what could be uh, changed at the Brazilian uh, level and with what systems maybe EU monitor monitoring uh, could work with. We have received uh, a number of questions. Um, the questions on EU policy to uh, the members of parliament, we will address them later in the Q&A session. We'll now only take uh, questions of clarification for uh, Helen and Raoni. I would like to read out the questions because we're uh, a bit running behind time. So I'm looking now at the Q&A. Uh, Helen, there is a question for you on uh, how come uh, China has a, a lower deforestation risk uh, to the EU and could the EU easily move to uh, different uh, places in Brazil to lower its uh, deforestation risk? Helen, I believe you've also seen the questions in the chat. Could you briefly speak to that? Great. So yes, so some sourcing patterns are a facet of geography and history. So the EU historically has a higher soy deforestation risk with its imports because Europe is closer to northern ports in Brazil, where deforestation risk is more concentrated in the Amazon and Sahado. Um, but equally, that's why the EU has a lower cattle deforestation risk because it's tended to buy through the CISPOV. Um, animal traceability system where most ranches are registered in the south and center of Brazil um, and also due to the export licensing of states due to health uh, reasons with foot and mouth disease and others. So it is a product of geography and history um, and we do see that a lot of sourcing patterns are fairly sticky. Um, in terms of leakage, yes, Europe could just buy its soy from the United States if it just wanted to reduce its imported deforestation risk um, or try and buy from um, exporters who have footprints to the south of Brazil, for example, Coamo, who export a lot to Germany or Louis Dreyfus, um, but that's not going to address the issue. Um, and I think that's where, you know, from what we see in the data, risk is highly concentrated and that's an opportunity to tangibly address the risks in those areas, whether it's investment in supporting compliance, so farmers to register for the forest code, or whatever it may be. And that's why it's good to see in the EU action plan, one of the priorities is investment in produ producing regions. Hopefully that answers the questions. Helen, thank you very much. Um, we'll also let the attendants know that any questions that we will not have time to answer live, there will uh, be the possibility to receive written answers from the panelists. I would now like to turn to Raoni, uh, who has received the two questions on his technical proposal for a different monitoring system. 
Rauni, one question was whether the existing CISPOF system together with the car and trace does not already sufficiently uh, monitor what we try to do here. You will also see the question in the, in the chat. So using the car as one of the instruments to prove that a certain production, cattle in this case, or originates from a property that respects the environmental leg legislation, we do not run the risk of, of certifying a producer who may be making irregular use of the land. Could you uh, clarify whether there is a risk or, or not mm -hmm. on this? Yeah, in relation to the first question, the problem is we have found that the properties which are already part of CISBOV and are already part of the, of the expert system, uh, which go through a very expensive procedure to be able to export to the EU and actually have on-site inspections by the EU itself, including also the Minister of Environment, uh, of Minister of Agriculture in Brazil, they still have a very high level of deforestation and it still by calves from areas with deforestation because the system was built for sanitary reasons, not for environmental reasons. And, and, and on top of that, uh, I think which generates to the more general issue, uh, CISBOV covers now uh, less than 10% of the herd in Brazil. And what we need is not uh, a, a niche market for the EU without deforestation. We need a sector without deforestation. We need Brazil without deforestation. Uh, just in relation to soy, we have also found a similar number, about 20% of the soy produced in Brazil is linked to deforestation that it's exported to the EU. Uh, but then Brazil consumes 40% of the soy it produces. So it's just, you know, switch things. Consume all the deforestation soy and export all the non-deforestation soy. And that, again, wouldn't solve the problem and that the forest would start failing. So that's why we, we insist on the importance of using uh, systems which are already in place and already have universal coverage. Uh, in relation to uh, um, uh, basically uh, the, uh, the social risks uh, and uh, the social environmental risks, many of them raised by, by Adrian, I think this is a, uh, um, this is a big problem. And, and, we, with you, and actually, when you analyze the data, uh, we have found that many uh, properties actually selling uh, the, the produce and the beef to uh, meat packers, and those meat, some meat packers also involved in exports, are located inside indigenous areas, are located inside uh, uh, conservation areas. If you have the location, uh, then it might be possible to find, it might be possible to even prosecute or in, and to uh, uh, improve the monitoring of supply chains. Of course, it's a cat and mouse situation. Uh, when people find that their data is being is more transparent, they might move and try to basically bypass some of those issues. But then it becomes also a police issue, a, 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 issue of a police investigation and, and better uh, um, uh, law enforcement. So, of course, this, this, uh, the proposal here does not solve all problems, but I think it's, a, it's an important step towards uh, um, uh, increasing transparency of supply chains. Rahonis, uh, thank you very much for this clarification. I think it's now time to formally um, introduce the two representatives of the National Congress of uh, Brazil. We will have uh, two, re two reactions, two presentations. First, I would like to introduce Mr. C. Silva, an agronomist from Minas Gerais, who has been a member of uh, Parliament in Brazil since 2011. He is a parliamentarian who proposed more than 80 bills, uh, we have heard, some of them related to the environmental agenda, such as the one he will be presenting to us today. He has also been invited by the president of the lower house to join the formulation of the lower house's green agenda and he's on very important committees such as the agro environmental policies and food and health committee uh, mr silva your excellency the floor is yours thank you very much indeed for the opportunity to participate in such an important debate in relation to sustainability sustainability i'm an agricultural engineer and i work all my life with agricultural and family uh, smallholders and i started uh, in a family farm actually in our bill, as it has been put forward, we have several 
measure together with other members of the lower house. We are putting the sustainability agenda forward and we are hoping that in 2020 we will be able to put to a vote these bills by the lower chamber and also the upper house, which is our Senate. Amongst these bills in terms of sustainability, I want to highlight that I was the leader of the committee which investigated the Brumadinho disaster, the dam, and that was linked to mining. But in terms of sustainability, we have two projects ongoing. One which we are proposing is to give an award to agricultural farms which are keeping in place natural forests and based on the study uh, which was presented by Professor Raoni and by other authorities and environmentalists in Brazil and also uh, players in the market, I put the bill forward. It's called uh, Green AgriSil. It's a certification uh, for agricultural producers who are preserving the environment and we measure the size of the property and the INCRA is the institute, uh, the Brazilian institute responsible for providing that seal and also environmental regulation based on the uh, CAR, which uh, was presented by Professor Rowney here. And once we are able to provide the seal, we want to make sure that in, in environmental terms, this is all sound. Next slide. So this land a regulation, as I highlighted, shows the need in Brazil. We have one million families who are working with agri family agriculture and they don't have land tenure and we have 80 million hectares as well. 270,000 people who don't have land tenure and especially for family uh, agriculture smallholders and they need to be able to have these documents as uh, 90% of them need that in order to be able to provide food for the supply chain so the car is very important as presented by professor rowney and we have other types of certificates as well that can be obtained once they have land tenure. Next slide, please. Very well. The aim uh, is to achieve transparency in terms of the um, cattle and agricultural production in Brazil. We want to include the origin control in a unified system which would be the main system managed by the Ministry of Agriculture and a key point for Brazil is to fulfill all social and environmental norms not just nationally but internationally and follow all these rules in order to avoid deforestation and especially illegal deforestation because Brazil occupies 8% of its territory producing agricultural and, and cattle. Next slide, please. Very well. Which will be the benefits of this new law? We want to protect uh, producers who are following the rules because in Brazil, the great majority of uh, agricultural producers, they are respecting the environment and the Brazilian state needs to help them to show that they are uh, in compliance and we need to really understand who's who here. So this certification 
won't bring any new costs for uh, agricultural producers. And our concern are the smallholders, family agricultural farms, and they represent 85% of producers in Brazil. And another key point, as put forward by Professor Rayoni when he studied data, is to keep confidentiality of uh, protected data. Next slide, please. Another benefit, it has a low implementation cost because for the government, they just need to adjust the existing systems. So the federal government through the Ministry of Agriculture and the Institute responsible for land uh, tenure and utilization, so they can use public uh, existing data from the CAR and also the National Environment System called CISNAMA in order to ensure these environmental regulation and social regulation. Next slide, please. Very well. Just to conclude my presentation, these uh, green agri seal will enable the identification, a clear one for all consumers, so they know where these products are coming from and they know they are uh, in compliance with environmental rules and they are not contributing to illegal deforestation. With this, I would like to conclude. So next slide, please. I'd like to thank you for your attention and just to say that this bill uh, integrates two key points, transparency as well as having effective measures whereby us as deputies, as members of the, parla the, the parliament, we want to fight for uh, good environmental practices. Thank you very much and I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Silva, uh, for this uh, positive proposal. Congratulations on proposing uh, this bill to the Parliament. I would now like to formally introduce uh, Mr. Fabiano Contarato, Senator from Espiritu Santo and uh, Professor of Criminal Law. Uh, this is his first term in the Brazilian Senate with a strong commitment to fight against corruption and impunity, fight for social inclusion and against all forms of discrimination. Mr. Contarato is also the president of a new campaign to make the Brazilian population aware of the importance of preserving the environment. Uh, Your Excellency, we are listening to your reactions to this bill and your proposals. First of all, I want to thank you for the opportunity to participate in this debate, which strengthens what's important to the world, to the population, to our country, which is to preserve the environment. To conserve the environment is a human right. It's a fundamental human right and it's part of international treaties and conventions and it's part of the constitution of Brazil, especially in Article 225, which says that we, are, we have the, the right to a balanced environment and to a sound environment. And we know that Brazil is extremely important because we are a very strong player in the agribusiness, but we also have the largest tropical forest in the world. What's happening in Pantanal is a tragedy, and we knew it was coming. We are aware that deforestation is a reality taking place in the Amazon region, and it will have repercussions in climate change 
and it may have an impact in fires in the Pantanal region as well. So I just want to bring this alert to you because the Amazon region is extremely important. We have to understand that daily it produces 20 billion uh, tons of rain and that rain is going to go to all areas of Brazil and it will help to rivers and seas. It helps to control uh, marine life, levels of salt and environmental conservation. Therefore, this is very important. But in Brazil, we are experiencing a serious issue. We have a health crisis and we have 4.8 million people contaminated by COVID-19 reaching 144,000 people who lost their lives because of the new coronavirus. So we have a health crisis and we are facing an environmental crisis as well. And we can't argue against that. We have more fires, deforestation, the authorization to use pesticides as well. And they are very harmful to human health. Therefore, us in the parliament, in Congress, we have to be very vigilant and we are working very hard when the federal government is trying to put forward any measures against the environment. We are trying to fight back. And when we can't fight back through parliament, we are trying to take it to the Supreme Court, to uh, the courts and trying to uh, prevent those new measures to be enforced. So this is a very difficult time for us, but Parliament is trying to contain and to make these people accountable. So we have essential um, measures to try and fight illegal acts. First, we need surveillance, we need scrutiny. So the Brazilian government needs to uh, scrutinize. We have to strengthen the environmental agency. We have to value NGOs, the scientific community, academia, because they play a very important role in the state. So the Brazilian state needs to strengthen surveillance and we need to implement and also renew our environmental education. So if we educate people, if we have surveillance and if we have sound legislation ensuring severe sanctions for those committing environmental crimes. They are what we call uh, eco sites because they reach a lot of people. They damage the environment, which is used by a lot of people. It's not just a harm to the environment or to the forest or in Pantanal or Cerrado, but it really harms the old communities, the, the local communities which are being decimated in Brazil. And Parliament is working very strongly. We are very vigilant. And as the head of the Environmental uh, Committee in the Senate, we held several public hearings and I summoned various ministers to uh, contribute for us to understand what is happening and what will be the answers from the government. And I see with a very positive eyes uh, the new uh, or a body which will serve perform the surveillance of agricultural and cattle uh, activities in Brazil so they are aware in government that we can produce in a sound manner, in a sustainable manner. We can have a green economy, we can generate jobs, we can reduce social inequality, but with sustainability. As I said, what Amazon produces in terms of rainfall, it would have been uh, necessary to uh, build several uh, hydroelectric powers such as Itaipu and that would take uh, some 150 years. So we have technology to keep the forest in place, to preserve and conserve the environment and to really make 
this right, this constitutional right be valid because all of us have the right to have a sound environment and we can preserve these rights in Brazil Currently, we know that we have several f setbacks, but in the Senate and in the lower house, we're doing everything that is possible to contain any damages or any illegal activities in regards to all biomes, not just the Pantanal, but Cerrado, the man mangroves and in the Amazon forest. So I'm um, available here to answer your questions. And I want to highlight the role which NGOs have been playing in Brazil. They are extremely important to us currently in these very difficult times. And I want to congratulate academia as well, especially uh, represented here by Professor Rauni. He's, he's very committed and he knows he can talk to us in the Senate. And I want to say that the federal Senate must understand that power should come from people and we need to interact with society to preserve this collective right and also to try and preserve what we all need, which is a good environment. So I'm happy to answer your questions and I want to say everything we can do in terms of legislation as well as to try and make the state, the, the federal government accountable from a civil perspective or penal perspective, regardless of whether they are producers or civil servants, whoever is practicing that crime um, in, due to inaction or action, we have to act because we are responsible for positive uh, behaviors, but also to penalize illegal behavior. And we shouldn't omit ourselves from doing what we can. So again, thank you very much for organizing this uh, webinar today. So with these discussions, we can move forward positively in Brazil in a sustainable manner, and we can have a green economy, which is perfectly possible providing income to people, but keeping the environment uh, alive. And we can all have win-win solutions, having such a beautiful country in Brazil, but looking forward towards justice, equality, and sustainability. So thank you very much for your attention. Dear Senator, thank you very much uh, for showing us the uh, progressive forces. Uh, fighting for the respect of human rights and the protection of um, the environment. We have two clarification questions now to uh, Raoni and uh, Congressman Silva. It's, a, it's about how the new system proposed would work for smallholders and guarantees inclusiveness and um, yeah, neutrality being a, a governmental system, as you propose. Uh, so, Nicole, thanks for, thanks for the question. Um, so, one of the issues right now is that uh, it's possible for farmers to get some sort of evaluation, but that's very expensive. Uh, to join, for instance, uh, to implement CISBOV, uh, which basically traces the individual cattle, or to join and be part of the expert system, the EU expert system, it causes, it costs actually thousands uh, of, of euros, uh, which means that for the small farmer, it's not possible to do so. Uh, on the other hand, you have uh, systems which, uh, of course, uh, have limitations, but are nevertheless universal. They are already obligatory and has been invested uh, uh, hundreds of millions uh, of euros uh, in implementing, for instance, the environmental registry, including uh, donations from Norway to the Amazon Fund, which has been applied uh, to register small farmers uh, within the system. Uh, so by making the system uh, and connect that to other uh, and to enforce the system and to make it more uh, um, connected also to the productive side uh, uh, of, um, of agriculture, especially in relation to the cattle movements, uh, it would be possible to have more information about that without adding an extra cost uh, uh, to farmers. Uh, in relation to how to um, keep the integrity of the system, I think there are two sides to that. First, uh, there's going to be the provision of uh, the geographic information 
uh, via the car number because the car is is uh, provides you can you know with a number anyone can go there and download uh, the geographic information about the farm and then do in the uh, independent evalu independent evaluation of, of whether there has been deforestation there uh, whether that that farm is inside uh, traditional territory indigenous uh, indigenous land so on and so forth so that uh, allows uh, that level of transparency and independent checking then of course there are some levels of data that's not going to be uh, um, uh, disclosed for instance uh, whether the connection between uh, the cattle movement and uh, the individual farm whether that's being done in a correct way or not and that's why I think it's very important uh, for, for that for that work to, to happen uh, to also to uh, have uh, the follow-up uh, uh, from researchers uh, that work in collaboration with the government uh, to, do, to do a proper implementation of the system. And so I think there is, there, there is a possibility to do that, especially uh, if following the approval of the legislation, there is also the creation of, of a, a scientific committee uh, to evaluate the system as it improves over time. Much. Uh, this is very clear. I uh, would like to ask another question of clarification asked by an um, at attendant. How could this, as we talk here about the uh, trade relationship, uh, EU-Brazil, uh, how could uh, the EU use such a system when it uh, ha has um, uh, announced that it will create an observatory on deforestation. So how do you see the EU and Brazil could work together in using this system or making sure that it works properly? Uh, well, in relation to the, the forest observatory, it happens that uh, it's, it's being led by the Joint Research Center and we already have col scientific collaborations with them. Uh, and so I think when we debate issues on a technical level and, and on a scientific level, it's possible to move forward and it's possible to have a robust system, uh, also with the suggestion, with the contribution uh, uh, from, from, from other researchers. Uh, of course, uh, um, in, there is still an ongoing discussion in the EU of what are going to be exactly uh, the, the requirements of the due diligence. In the same way, uh, the, the Forest Observatory, the EU Forest Observatory is still under construction, but I think that we have the opportunity here to build something together because I think that's a crucial point here. Uh, it's, it's not uh, a good for either Brazil or the EU to impose a system on each other and then to create loss of mitras and then to create loss of problems. What we need here is really to, to join hands and to work uh, towards a technical scientific driven uh, solution for this issue. Thank you very much, Raoni. Uh, with this, we're moving yet to another section of this uh, webinar. We will have uh, three respondents um, to the proposals that have just been made by uh, science, advocacy, and uh, the Brazilian parliament. Um, the first will be uh, from a company representative of uh, Marfrig, a big slaughterhouse in Brazil. And I understand Leonel uh, Almeida is here with us and will give his reaction. Thank you very much. Bom dia a todos. Muito obrigado. Good morning to all. Thank you very much for inviting me. As mentioned, mentioned previously by the other panelists, it is a, a great opportunity to be able to present our views and promote the debate. This is a very positive and interesting initiative, especially since we are pursuing common goals. Even though the path we decide to take may be a little different, I believe we do share the same uh, goals and uh, the possibility of taking joint action and promoting good practices together is uh, very positive. Uh, from what from what we have heard today we are happy to be able to take part as representatives of a huge industry that is clearly connected to the environment in Brazil Mafrig is the second largest beef producer in the world and we have been working with certification and deforestation throughout our supply chain. This is a team that is actually part of our routine activities. We have uh, satellite monitoring since 19, uh, 29, uh, sorry, 29, 2009. 
and we cover uh, an area equivalent or even larger than the United Kingdom in area. And from our past experience, we realize that we find limitations in the systems in place in Brazil to analyze the whole supply chain. This is very distributed throughout the whole of Brazil. We cover a huge area and we have difficulties to monitor all di direct and indirect suppliers. So direct suppliers are those that deliver cattle to slaughterhouses and the indirect services are those that uh, provide services to cattle raisers. So we released a new plan uh, in last July to clarify all the points of uh, throughout the supply chain in the beef industry and also to provide transparency and information to all consumers of our products in Brazil and internationally. I believe Brazil is able to contribute to improve our position in sustainability in regards to deforestation uh, tackling policies. We have very good mechanisms in place in Brazil already. Something that I wanted to raise to your attention is that when we are facing a new moment with a setback or boycott of environmental legislation, this is not new. This has already uh, happened in the past. We had changes in the deforestation code before, for instance. We are trying to address these issues in the plan we issued last July. Actually, we need something that contributes to solve the problems. And when you exclude people from the process, you only make matters worse. You need to include producers to debate and advance solutions for existing problems. So we believe that the path should be reversed. We need to implement practices that help us identify the problems with the help of producers. And I want to make a remark that I agree with the issue raised by, the point raised by other panelists. The legality uh, aspect is very important to be mentioned and implemented. But we also have properties that have uh, cleared forest to carry out their activities that have not incurred in illegal deforestation. So I think it's important to um, identify the problems properly. Once we identify where the problems lie, then we initiate the actions to include all the stakeholders so that producers are able, able to join the production chain in a sustainable manner. So with uh, sustainable practices in uh, forest management that involve uh, not only land uh, legislation, but also human rights and labor legislation. So in our opinion, uh, this uh, fluctuation and going back and forth in the legislation harms the possibility of long-term initiatives to be implemented. So in conclusion, my main point for you to take away is that I want to reinforce what has been mentioned before. We already work with a supply chain monitoring and making sure that all steps of in the production chain are sustainable and compliant. And we believe that the more transparency we have, the, the most positive of this process is going to be.
for the environment. So when we join our efforts and we have a common goal in view, we will achieve much better solutions in the short and medium term. And that's what I wanted to say to you today. Once again, I congratulate you on the initiative of promoting the webinar, and I make myself available to answer your questions and hear your comments. Thank you again for having me. Lionel, thank you uh, very much. Thank you for uh, sharing this com commitment to uh, monitor indirect uh, suppliers, which has long been an issue of conversation in the beef sector in, in Brazil. Uh, I'd now like to invite a member of the European Parliament of the Environmental Committee, Mr. Nikolai Stefanuta, to the floor. And I hope he will have some exciting news about a vote in the Environmental Committee today on the EU legislative framework to halt and reverse deforestation. Mr. Stefanuta, the floor is yours. Muito obrigado. Can you hear me and can you see me? Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you for the presentation. You stole my thunder. Indeed, I do have exciting uh, news. Uh, but even more exciting, I, I find, to have a debate with policymakers, with people from, uh, with stakeholders, with activists across the Atlantic. And that makes me think of one thing. When it comes to the environment, we are not separate continents. We are all one single continent. And I think um, what's happening in the Amazon forest right now, it concern, concerns uh, us as Europeans just as much as you as, as Brazilians and that uh, the report that we drafted and voted today also takes note of the fact that we are part of the problem uh, because we are encouraging the same patterns, uh, the production patterns that we try to tackle. Deforestation is happening worldwide at an alarming rate. It also happens here in Europe. Uh, we, from the, in the country where I come from, which is Romania, uh, chainsaws do the work uh, that uh, forest fires do in Brazil. So uh, further to that, European consumption has an impact on forests worldwide, as we saw the data previously, and we want to hold this and give consumers the information they need to buy deforestation free. So it is in this context that the European Parliament has repeatedly called on the Commission to, Commission is our governing body, our, our government, let's say, for the European Union to step up the action against deforestation. Because so far there was no coherent legal framework addressing forest risk commodities, as you have heard it also from my colleague Moishel uh, from Austria. And uh, that's why in September 20, 2019, uh, the Environment Committee, where I'm a member, decided to drop a legislative own initiative report to come up with a possible framework. Today, that report was voted in the Environment Committee. I am very pleased to tell you that it passed 45 to 25 votes. So not without opposition, not easily, but nevertheless, importantly. And we have uh, established a legal framework to ensure a high level of protection for natural forests. We are not there yet, of course. The plenary needs to ratify it and the commission needs to implement it, but it is a very, very important uh, step forward. First point that we have, we don't only talk about deforestation, but we chose a broader scope, including ecosystem destruction, forest and ecosystem degradation, and human rights violations. So our scope is more broad. Further uh, of all, we are convinced that mandatory sustainable uh, sustainability rules uh, are necessary and also mandatory due diligence uh, requirements that would provide benefits to business to leveling the playing field uh, by holding competitors to the same standards. Uh, this proposal should also call, uh, cover all commodities and most frequently uh, as commodities that are associated with deforestation, degradation, etc. And there should be a list drawn by our European Commission of what exactly these commodities are. The list should include at least uh, palm oil, soy, meat, leather, cocoa, coffee, rubber, and maize. 
we saw that the certification schemes are not sufficient uh, and they're not the best. Uh, they can be a complementary system, but they're not the, 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 the way to go forward. And goods placed on the union market should not originate from land obtained via the conversion of natural forests or originate from forests or ecosystems undergoing degradation, etc. Um, operators should take all the necessary measures to respect and ensure the protection of human rights, natural forests, and natural ecosystems. And they should also take a risk-based approach to due diligence, where the nature and extent of due diligence corresponds to the type and level of risk or and adverse impacts. Higher risk areas are subject to higher due diligence. I have a list of other measures that we, that we basically uh, put forward in this draft legislation, uh, but I think most importantly is the message that uh, Europe does not accept to be a part of the problem anymore, and we want to help you. This is not legislation to make imports from Brazil harder. This is not the purpose of that. This is legislation to make production that goes into Europe more sustainable and to reduce the effect of the incentive to produce more and cut more and, uh, and invade more forests to take it off the table. Now there is another aspect, that of the cutoff date. From what date do we start counting? That was a subject of a big debate and in the end, we decided on no later than 2015. Because if we chose a date that is the present or the future, we would still provide an incentive for operators to, to deforest as much as they can until that date happens. So that is why uh, we chose a date in the recent past. So thank you once more. Uh, I keep the fingers crossed for the colleagues uh, who presented the initiatives in the Brazilian parliament. Uh, as legislator, I have, uh, I have uh, you know, lots of empathy for that. And also I didn't want to, to finish by not thanking uh, Victor for his impressive pictures. And, and what he said touched me a lot when he said that what is not captured in the pictures is the, scream, uh, the screams of all the animals who perish with the deforestation. It was a very, very touching, uh, touching uh, piece of, uh, you know, touching statement. So thank you once more for inviting me. I'm very happy to be, to keep in contact uh, with you. So uh, uh, look forward to the discussion today. Thank you. Nikolai, uh, thank you very much. Thank you for sharing the good news on the uh, adopted uh, report in the Environmental uh, Committee on calling for uh, due diligence on companies. We hope that the report will go through in the plenary also later this autumn. With this, I'd like to call uh, on our final, but uh, yeah, not least speaker uh, from the German presidency, from the German Ministry of Economic Cooperation and uh, Development, and would like to ask for Lisa Kirchruhle's views on this and concluding remarks. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, thank you very much. I have big head on. on. <laughs> Never mind. So thank you for the uh, valuable presentations and um, and um, the questions so far. Uh, we are very engaged um, against deforestation and. Brazil is one um, very uh, urgent case, but of course not the only one. <laughs> this is why we do engage not only in our EU presidency, but as well in the Amsterdam Declaration Partnership. Uh, against deforestation. 
this is why we um, issued an open letter to Brazil's Vice President Moral. Um, signed by the members of the Amsterdam Declaration Partnership. Lisa, we cannot hear you so well. Uh, maybe it works better when if you turn off your video and we just listen to the sound. Maybe that is, uh, there's a bandwidth problem. Thank you. Is this better now? It's much better, thank you. Much better. Okay. So, um, so, as we just heard as well from the European level, um, our ministry very strongly welcomes a legisl legislative proposal to minimize deforestation, and we look forward to the coming process. As in in the farm to fork and the biodiversity strategy um, in May 2020. Lisa, we are losing you sometimes. Yeah. And if I talk like that, is that better? Um, please pursue and uh, I'll let you know if it's not working. Okay, I tried because then I put down the headphones um, I, and I tried to talk. Um, yeah, let's, let's make it short. We have two conclusions, uh, one um, from the presentations. First, transparency and traceability are a key element to eliminate deforestation from EU supply chain. And second, regulatory demand, demand side measures and support for producing countries. Lisa? Um, support for producing countries? Lisa, it's not working well. Um, okay. Our interpreter is saying... Someone of the environment. So we try to um, remove the, the headphones and go back to the initial solution, even if there is a every an echo um, please try to also um, disable your interpretation function maybe there is a, a blending issue there That's doom. So is this good yet? Um, we can see it's good hören. Now we can hear you well, someone was saying. Lisa, I think uh, we can proceed. Um, we might have lost Lisa just now. I think she was logging off and uh, logging in again. I suggest that uh, as we have very uh, little time left that uh, we, ah, Lisa, you're back on. Lisa, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Um, can you yeah. hear me? Perfect. Uh, if it's an echo, I have, you, you know, we it's don't. It's good now, okay. it's good now. Okay, nice. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to support, uh, to underline again, again, the support uh, for producing countries and this, and the regulatory demand side, demand side measures that are really two sides of the same coin and we need to discuss them closely together. Mm, and um, uh, notably the presentations by Ms. Belfield and Mr. Rajao highlighted that deforestation risks along global supply chains can be clearly assessed and traced back if we have the right institutions in place. So it's technologically possible, that's very good. Um, and from our view, such instruments should be really integrated into the upcoming EU measures um, and placed on the European market. Um, and 
the suggested Brazilian observatory could be an important interlocutor for actors in the EU and information could be fed into the European observatory on deforestation. Um, the system suggested could support companies with risk assessments to eliminate deforestation from their supply chains. Uh, but it would be crucial, though, that this system would be connected to global trade data, supply chain mapping and traceability tools for individual supply chains, um, thereby allowing for full traceability. <clears throat> and um, it would be important to understand better who would be the members of such an observatory and about the objectives and um, uh, on what basis um, the observatory would, um, or which process um, would flag a farm. So uh, let's uh, continue this conversation. Um, and would this require a validation from the farm's uh, CAR entry? Uh, so I think that the details are quite decisive. Um, and um, however, we have to look into the details as far as I understood Mr. Rajal's presentation and the Rotten Apples report published earlier this year, it focuses on identifying illegal deforestation at farm level. Um, and as European measures might go well beyond illegal deforestation, we'll have to initiate transparency instruments that flag deforestation in general, so not only illegal, and to support upcoming EU regulation on deforestation. So that we talk about as well zero cross deforestation on a supply chain level. Um, this is as well very important for the Amsterdam Declaration Group discussion. Um, and experiences with the European timber regulation show um, the more information on deforestation risks we have, the better. Uh, only then measures for risk mitigation can be implemented and non-compliance is prov proven. Um, yeah. So it's, it's very important to have these instruments. Um, and as we, uh, as we mentioned, uh, to ensure the acceptance of European regulation, but regulation by producing countries, it will be crucial to support producing countries with uh, meeting the European demand side regulation and to pro provide incentives I think, for example, in case of Brazil as a really very powerful, uh, economic powerful country, the incentives are not uh, financially. So we have to find the right combination. Um, and we have to support, this is why we have to support front, front runners for zero, zero deforestation, be it civil society or political actors, all already many companies who are really moving forward, uh, 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 yes, good ideas. Mm. Um, yeah, so um, in Brazil, the Environmental Rural Registry, the CAR, as I mentioned, is really crucial to make deforestation transparent and traceable. And therefore, our ministry recently extended its support for implementing the CAR in both the Amazon and the Cerrado. In addition to the federal state Acre, Rondonia, Amazonas and Pará, soy producing areas in the state of Maranhão will be included in the context of a BMZ, so our ministry commissioned new project for a sustainable soy production region in the state of Maranhão. We uh, wish us luck that everything is going right with this project. And so concluding from our perspective, um, the new instrument of forest, EU forest partnerships that um, the 
uh, Director General DEVCO, so the development uh, side, has announced will be as well an important instrument to design and finance measures uh, supporting producing countries with reducing commodity-driven deforestation. Um, and transparency initiatives in producing countries uh, that feed in a European observatory and thereby support both the implementation and enforcement of EU regulation um, might be important activities to be supported by the European Forest Partnerships, which will be, uh, which are in discussion at the moment. So there is really a window of opportunity to bring in um, all these ideas now. Uh, yes, thank you um, for your attention. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, uh, Germany. Uh, all the best for the continuation of the presidency. We are very happy to hear the strong support also on a technical cooperation level. Um, we will have time, I think, only for uh, another two questions, probably. There was a one uh, directed from another panelist to you, from Adriana. Um, I will give it straight to you back, Lisa. Will your support also include the strengthening of civil society and NGOs to uh, monitor um, the, the issues in Brazil? As you said, you're going to be active on deforestation. Um, well, uh, of course, um, as we, um, we have a long tradition of cooperation with Brazil, so there has been always cooperation with civil society, be it uh, through the civil so uh, funds for civil society partnerships from, let's say, for example, from the churches here in, in, in Germany, Port für die Welt, Bread for the World, uh, who work in Brazil, but um, uh, as well within the mentioned project, uh, in the project I mentioned, uh, where we would like to work with a multi-stakeholder approach, of course, um, we uh, would then work together with civil society. Um, and um, yeah, and, and then we, we do, of course, work as civil society in our whole forestry policy. So there is a lot of work with indigenous groups. Um, yeah, we have a whole range of cooperation, um, but of course, uh, there are very specific ideas, uh, you can always uh, feed them in, and um, we are always keen to learn. Thank you very much. Uh, we are three minutes um, to closure, and I, I know we need to close soon and be on time for the uh, interpreters. So I will just uh, ask one uh, last question that I saw in the chat um, to the Brazilian Congressman Silva. Uh, just checking that he's still with us because uh, the, the senator unfortunately had si. to, to leave us to a hearing. Okay, great. Uh, uh, Karen Sassuana. Si, <laughs> Thank you. Is asking whether your initiative will also look at the respect of human rights. So how will the new Green Seal look at the issue of respect of human rights uh, um, and not just deforestation? Sí. Yes. The key aim when one respects not the fact that we have to understand the side of producers as well. As an agricultural engineer who worked with family agriculture, we developed programs for certification in, in collaboration with organic farmers and also coffee producers, coffee beans producers, to ensure uh, their uh, rights because they had uh, shown that they respected the environment and all the other legal requirements. So it's very important to have this interaction between you and this alignment between our bill, between the Brazilian bill and the EU project, because obviously we want to open to everybody participating to really give us your opinions. It's, it's just a bill for now, and we want to incorporate all other regulations that are being put forward, all these proposals for the uh, European Parliament. So we want to improve the, the scope of our legislation, obviously. Uh, to that. Uh, one of the main challenges 
uh, of human rights challenges right now is that there has been a huge expansion of cattle ranch inside protected areas, inside indigenous lands, inside Quilombola lands, which are from ex slaves. And when we know where that meat is coming from, and what's the network, and who is, is selling meat to who, and who's cat selling cattle to who, then that level of transparency allows buyers uh, to be aware and even to cut off uh, from their supply chains those that are involved in producing meat in areas with environmental, with social and environmental conflict. Thank you, uh, Mr. Silva. Thank you, Raoni, for uh, clarifying this, uh, the important scope. Uh, of the bill and what the new tool could do. Um, it looks exciting. I think we have promising initiatives uh, in both Brazil and the EU with the bills uh, going through the parliament. We hope that both will make it in the end through plenary and have the necessary majority. I think for today we have looked at uh, yeah, some of the promising uh, options and we will need many more uh, discussion fora to talk about the details of new regulation to be passed. For today I would like to thank uh, the panelists uh, but also the team who was working tirelessly in the, in the back office so to say to make this happen. I would like to uh, thank the interpreters and I would like to thank our funders, the British Foreign Office, Waterloo Foundation, for Ford Foundation, and uh, many more for their continued support to uh, bring this issue to the forefront. So thank you very much for today. Uh, we will field your written questions to the panelists. And as we have your email addresses, uh, if that's OK, the panelists will uh, answer your questions by email. So thank you very much. Have a good rest of the afternoon and good luck to the legislators uh, with the proposals. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you.